Shalom Aleichem, and welcome back to our continuing saga of the story of Galician Jewry in its East European context. Today we're going to look at the Haskalah, the movement of Jewish enlightenment. As with Hasidism, I'm going to fill in information about the broader Haskalah phenomenon, especially in Eastern Europe. We'll spend about half of our time today on Galicia, but I'm going to rely again on the readings that are assigned to have more details about the Galician iteration. And the richness of the Haskalah in Galicia is just another reminder that the image of the coarse, unlearned Galicianer, a stereotype which we'll talk about another time, this is just that. It's a stereotype with very little correlation to reality. Our agenda is as follows, as you see on the screen. We'll have maybe 10 minutes overview. What is the Haskalah? What is the Jewish Enlightenment? Where does it come from and what's it looking for? We'll then spend about 15 or 20 minutes looking at its spread to Galicia. And then the last 20 minutes looking at the spread of Haskalah to the Russian Empire. Uh, And in particular, I'm interested in three different moments, three uh, uh, sort of crescendos of of explosion of activity in Russian Empire, which will give us a sense of the course of the 19th century. So we begin. What exactly is the Haskalah? This is a difficult question. There are many books written on this. There's no single answer. In a simple sense, it's simply the name of the enlightenment among the Jews, Haskalah, from the Hebrew meaning intellect or reason. A follower of the Haskalah is called a maskil or maskilim in plural. And this begins really in the early to mid-1700s, mostly in Germany, where you have this early Haskalah movement, people interested really in renewing Jewish scientific traditions, Hebrew grammar, Jewish philosophy, internal sources of a rational Jewish tradition. This then progresses in the 1760s and 70s into a comprehensive program of social and cultural transformation. Not just renewing Jewish traditions, but a growing valuation of European secular studies also. So earlier trends of acculturation, the embrace of secular studies by isolated individuals, even some novel criticisms of Jewish life and thought and the spirit of the Enlightenment, this all now coalesces into a fully articulated movement known as the Haskalah, most famously associated or personified by Moses Mendelssohn. And this was absolutely religious conservative movement at first. There was no intention of undermining religious faith and religious practice. And this will remain the case, by the way, in Eastern Europe all the way into the 1860s. We want to avoid the common association of Haskalah, meaning religious reform. It wasn't that. It will become that eventually in some places, but that's not what Haskalah is about. The Haskalah is an intellectual movement seeking to integrate the Jews into European society, but as Jews, without denying their collective identity. It's looking to transform and rejuvenate Judaism and Jewish society through an embrace of European culture and Enlightenment values. So what does that actually mean? Number one, religion. The Maskilim are arguing for a rationalistic and historical interpretation of Judaism, and they promoted a positive Jewish identity, albeit a hyphenated identity, but a positive Jewish identity based on a romantic revitalization of biblical Hebrew and a scholarly encounter with Jewish history. It's part of the rational approach to religion that's happening across Western Europe, with also with Protestant faith and Catholic faith. Number two, education. Maskilim are embracing secular learning, languages, and manners. They're really accepting, uh, in in Ashkenazic world for the first time, the authority of non-Jewish thought and mores as at least equal to traditional Jewish teachings and maybe even better. And they desire to reform Jewish life according to European standards. Third, productivization. The idea of transforming the occupational structure of Jews, away from commerce, away from finance, to activities they found to be more productive and more morally uplifting, like agriculture and artisan crafts. Fourth, integration. This is not the same as assimilation. Integration means bringing the Jews socially, culturally, and politically into broader society as Jews. So when it comes to language, for example, Jews are traditionally, as we've seen, bilingual. They were traditionally speaking Yiddish, and scholarship was produced in Lushenkaidish, some kind of amalgam of various Hebrew and Aramaic dialects. They want to 
keep that bilingualism, but transform it. In place of Yiddish, Maskelim advocate German, and eventually when it moves to Eastern Europe, it might be Polish or Russian. But you abandon Yiddish, which is viewed really as in moral categories as morally problematic, and you adopt the local language, first and foremost German, and instead of Lush and Kodesh, this sort of amalgam of various Hebrew and Aramaic dialects, they want some kind of purified biblical Hebrew, a new bilingualism. And it's also promoting a new set of political assumptions because they want to integrate politically, and they are going to venerate the absolute state that we've been learning about very, very much and staunchly oppose any level of Jewish autonomy, very much criticizing the, the kahal, the leadership structure of the kila, and wanting to break down their authority, break down the caste, bring the Jews into European society. And Hasidism will be a particular opponent of them, as we'll see, viewed as obscurantist and so on. They really accept what David Sorkin has called the emancipation contract, the contract of rights for regeneration. Jews are expected to regenerate. There is an assumption that Maskilim accept that the Jews are, in a sense, degenerate. There was something wrong with Jewish society, with Jewish life. They have to reform themselves, and in exchange, they will achieve emancipation. Of course, they want the emancipation first, and they believe that the regeneration will follow. Others insist to go the other direction. But they essentially accept the contract, the connection between regeneration, the assumption of degeneracy, and the need to regenerate, and the connection of that to emancipation. In short, they need some... They're looking for, I should say, some sort of golden modernizing mean between tradition and assimilation. They want to move, as Israel Bartal put it in one of his writings, they want to move from a religious corporative identity, something that's appropriate for the old Polish commonwealth, Jews as a corporate estate based on religion, to a linguistic cultural identity more appropriate to a multinational empire based on Hebrew language as the cultural language of scholarship and prayer and a cultural ethnic identity, but integrating otherwise. And the linguistic dual dualism is a key part of that, speaking German but producing scholarship, reading Hebrew. This is the goal. Now, in Western Europe, it doesn't last more than a few decades. In Western Europe, the rise of Romanticism, the rediscovery of the mythic collective over the rational individual uh, the Haskalah dissolves, it, move, it switches into movements either for political emancipation, which takes them several decades in Germany, or, or else religious, religious reform, which begins in the 1820s and 30s. Pure Haskalah as an intellectual movement with its primarily educational focus, from that point on, from the second decade or so of the 19th century, will exist only in Eastern Europe, where it's going to emerge in the 1780s uh, along with the West, but only really get going right at the moment that it's dissolving in the West, around the 1810s and 1820s. And as in the West, the early Haskalah in the East is going to mean a revival of rationalist Jewish traditions together with acculturation, dress, language, education, productivization. In Russia especially, the Haskalah is going to remain distinct throughout the 19th century precisely because emancipation is not granted and a secular, non-Christian Russian nationalism does not emerge. The idea in the late 19th century, as Russian nationalism really begins to take off, the idea of Russians of the Jewish persuasion, the way we have in Germany, uh, Germans of the Mosaic faith and so on, that was an oxymoron to most Russians and, and to most Jews alike. Now, it's a little different in Galicia, uh, first of all, because in Galicia, emancipation does happen in the 1860s, but here too, Haskalah will survive until the 1860s before it finally evolves into various post-emancipatory political forms. The Eastern Haskalah represents an attempt to create a Jewish identity compatible with emancipation, to move the Jews towards secular culture and general acculturation in order to earn emancipation. Again, religious corporative identity into a linguistic cultural identity. In other words, they borrow the emancipation contract. And this rests on the assumption that emancipation would proceed in the East as it had in the West, an assumption that was actually confirmed in Galicia, as we'll see in the next class, but found to be eventually empty in Russia. So let's take a look at the first half, the story of the Haskalah in Galicia.
it's not surprised that Galicia would be the beginning of the Eastern Haskalah. Uh, Galicia's geographic and cultural connection to Germany led to its role as a gateway of the Haskalah into Eastern Europe. And the first East European Maskilim, Galicianers, were personally connected to Berlin. But the context of Polish-Austrian Galicia, of that milieu, is totally different in a few ways. It's not the, the rising bourgeois industrial economy in an increasingly enlightened society uh, moving towards general emancipation, as we see in Germany and elsewhere in Western Europe. That's not happening in Galicia. Galicia is the most backward province in Austria. Feudalism remains quite strong through the 19th century. The Maskilim, moreover, are surrounded by traditional Jews with deepening commitment to Yiddish and traditional culture as a result of the conquest of Hasidism, totally foreign to the German context. Remember the story of Hertz Hamburg. Hamburg was, was widely, and in contemporary views unfairly, but widely reviled by Galician Jews. Whereas Moses Mendelssohn and the Maskilim are absolutely celebrated and adored in the German context. Uh, moreover, the reactionary government of Metternich in Austria, already, you know, uh, uh, admittedly, he was rather disgusted and weary of the superstitious Hasidim, but he's even more wary of the reformist Maskilim. We're in a post Napoleonic world here. This is something the opponents of the Haskalah will actually know how to exploit quite nicely. The local, the local government functionaries in the major cities will be supportive of the Haskalah. They're mostly German-speaking bureaucrats, and they feel rather alienated in this Polish setting. So they're nationally supportive of the Maskilim. But ultimately, uh, they're going to be, and forgive the term in today's day and age, they're going to be trumped by the imperial concerns, as we shall see. And finally, the absence of a secular mononational middle class in which to integrate. In Germany, there is a large German middle class into which Jews can aspire and indeed succeed to integrate. That doesn't exist in Eastern Europe. And you know, it's the reason why East European Maskilim, they don't aspire to integrate into a nation, into a specific nation, at least at first. They aspire to integrate into empire, into the empire, which is why German remains the language of the East European Haskalah, especially in Galicia, for so many years. The Maskila communities first emerge in three cities in Galicia, in Brody, Lemberg, and Ternopil. You can see them on the screen, all in a sort of triangle there, already in the mid-1810s. And these, mas these, these Maskilim of these cities are typically credited with introducing the Haskalah movement into Eastern Europe. And they're holding regular meetings, they're helping the group congeal into a movement in those years. And these are the biggest names in the early East European Haskalah, Menachem Mendel Leffen, Yosef Perl, uh, Yehuda Lev Mises, Nachman Krochma, and many, many others are laying the foundation for Haskalah in the 19th century Eastern Europe. And the rise was made possible by the emergence of a wealthy class of Jewish merchants and professionals, especially lawyers, doctors, and pharmacists, in those three cities which are sponsoring them. Uh, as Nachman Krochma put it, describing Brody, one of the cities on the, on the border with Russia, it's, quote, a city where wisdom and wealth, Torah and understanding, commerce and faith are united. And that commerce economic piece is part of the values of the Haskalah, but also a real economic basis of the movement. And interestingly, while the Maskilim despised Yiddish as a corrupt language, and really it's hard for people today Maybe in Israel a little easier because of the politics of language in the 20s and 30s in Tel Aviv, for example. But Yiddish is not just something that's a problem because it blocks you from integration. It's really viewed in moral terms as a corrupt version of, uh, of, of German in some way, some kind of amalgam of language which isn't really real or pure. The best uh, connection, when I teach my American students, I talk about the politics over Ebonics the notion of, uh, in, in, in the discourse of black pride in the United States, where you have this discourse over Ebonics as a language, and other, uh, sometimes you have African-American intellectuals talking about Ebonics as not being a real language, it's corrupt, you have to abandon it for a pure English, and so on. That was sort of the discourse at the time, that Yiddish is this corrupt, morally corrupt language. But interestingly, we see Maskilim, at least some of them, already now, already in this early period, willing to publish in Yiddish -ish, for very practical purpose, the vast majority of Jews read no other language, not even Hebrew. Only the intellectual elite of Jewish society can read Hebrew well, a few percent, and mostly men. Uh, and some Maiskilim already are be willing to toy with Yiddish 
in order to reach the masses. Yosef Pearl, we'll talk about in a second, was one of them, but most famously it was Menachem Mendel Leffen. Uh, Pearl actually didn't publish his Yiddish translations, and Leffen did. And he has a bio, biography that's kind of typical of these masculine. He spent time in Berlin. He advances this masculine project grounded in sort of traditional Jewish sources. He was actually famously involved in the final, the four-year sem at the very end of the Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth. He was involved there trying to advocate for the Jewish cause. It was ill-fated, of course. The, the state was about to be uh, uh, divided up. Uh, and he's publishing Yiddish translations of biblical wisdom literature, for example, and other polemical works. And he's publishing in Yiddish, and of course arguing against Hasidism and so on, as we'll see in a second, but also arguing, uh, arguing for linguistic acculturation in Yiddish, arguing in Yiddish to move away from Yiddish, uh, which is sort of a doomed project from the beginning. It's one of the things we'll see later on, that when you start using Yiddish, no matter what you say, you're saying it in Yiddish and sort of making the point that Yiddish is a reasonable language in which to produce this kind of literature. But we'll come back to that in a later time. Now, their ideology, as expected, is focusing on education, on more refinement through European culture. And that means German language over Yiddish and so on. But what most united the Galician Maskilim in particular was their contempt and their campaign against Hasidism both with polemics and appeals to the state, and both of these failed, but they attempted to shut down Hasidic movement. And that's a result of the local reality, right? Hasidism spread very early and very quickly in the Galician province, and unquestionably, Yosef Pearl is the most famous advocate for this campaign. His most famous book, Megala Timirin, The Revealer of Secrets, is just this brilliant satire of, of the Shifrei Abesh, of the praise of the Baal Shem Tov, that hagiography of the, of the founder, of the so-called founder of the Hasidic movement. And it was such a good satire that actually Hasidim were buying it because they thought it was actually true stories of miracles of this, of this famous, of this, of this, of this magical man. And what, you know, the satire to us today should be quite clear, but it was missed at the time. So, for example, there's a, a story in there where a woman says, yeah, she's writing a letter and she explains, you know, unfortunately, tragically, my son was required for nine years to attend the local local German Jewish school, but thank God he learned nothing. That's the kind of satire that people missed if they're Hasidic, but were able to understand if they got the, the gist of what he was going at. He especially despised Rabbi Nachman. Rabbi Nachman of Bratislav, one of his most famous publications are these stories, these incredible stories that are actually celebrated by literary scholars today as in amazing achievements. Uh, very deep Kabbalistic imagery through these stories of princes and, prince and, and, and kings and so on. And he hated them because they make no sense. They're fairy tales trying to teach Judaism, and he despised them. Uh, and there's a lot about Rav Nachman he despised. Rav Nachman has a lot of uh, anti-rational aspects to him. Um, I want to point out that this campaign against Hasidism is unique in Galicia, not only vis-a-vis -vis Berlin, but even in Congress Poland. Eventually it comes to Congress Poland, but it takes a few decades later. Uh, the spread of Hasidism very early on in Galicia, even before Congress Poland, is, is part of the story of what's going on here. And it penetrates deep into the community hierarchy. It has widespread appeal. Hasidic movement is not only attracting simple people, it's attracting wealthy people too, attracting learned people as well. Uh, Pearl and, me, and the, another uh, leader on your screen, Yudha Mises, they themselves are quite affluent and successful. It's one of the reasons why they alone uh, published anti-Hasidic polemics with no fear of Hasidic pushback. Uh, Pearl, we already spoke about. Mises' most famous work is probably Kinata Emet, The Zeal for Truth, 1828. Uh, and here, you know, he's fighting standard goals of Haskalah, blah, 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 but really the clear enemy is Hasidism. So what is he calling for? Well, number one, education reform. Bible and Hebrew language, Bible over Talmud. Hebrew language along with European languages, natural science, history, ethics, all these good things. But he's also attacking beliefs in spirits, in demons, and in magic. These are very important part of Hasidic movements. Uh, but they're also, by the way, important part of Jewish tradition. The Talmud, for example, is laden with references to demons and so on, something that he really uh, try, either is unaware of or tries to suppress. And of course, the Zohar and the Kabbalah in general are viewed by him as some kind of foreign pollution, which is quite distinct from the Mitnagdim, who equally hate the Hasidim, but themselves are also deeply uh, uh, steeped in Kabbalah and certainly revealed, re revere it and the Zohar.
Uh, he attacks Sadiqim, the Hasidic leaders, as conmen, as swindlers. He pulls no punches, no illusions whatso- whatsoever. He's quite clear about them. Uh, he's also somewhat uh, anti-historical and scientifically unfounded in his analysis of Judaism. We already saw that with the uh, demons, but you know, that's, that's okay. He was clear what he was trying to do. Uh, and he is not satirical. He is not uh, using any kind of nuance. He's quite explicit. He doesn't have the kind of, I don't know, rhetorical flourishes that some other, as one scholar put it, that some other uh, books have. He doesn't bring proof texts or quotations from the Bible. No attempt at cleverness. Just laying it out on, on the table. Um, that's where he goes. Uh, in response to him, arguably the greatest of all of the Galician Meskili, Nachman Krachmal, he steps into the brink. And his most famous work, which is only published posthumously, unfortunately, Guide to the Perplexed of Our Time, really was in many ways a game changer. Uh, a ma- uh, an incredible work that I don't have time to discuss in full. Uh, it's obviously, if you know your history, parodying the name of Moses Maimonides' great work, The Guide to the Perplexed, but it's The Guide to the Perplexed of Our Time. So he wants to bring, you know, just like Maimonides is speaking to the, what we, I guess we'd say, sort of the scientifically, academically educated people of his day. People who say, I want to be Jewish, I want to believe, but I've also learned philosophy and science as it, as it was understood back then. And, I, and, I, and Maimonides says, well, that's no problem. Here's how we put them together. He's doing the same thing, but he's adding the dimension of historical analysis to rational Judaism. That's something that's absent largely in Maimonides, and he's adding that because that's the perplexed of today, of the, eight, of the mid-1800s. They're perplexed. They want to integrate historical analysis, and he's able to do it. And almost all subsequent masculine in Galicia and also and beyond are studying under him, either directly or indirectly. Most famously, for example, Solomon Yehuda Rappaport, his house becomes a center of Haskalah in Lemberg. Uh, and he was fiercely attacked by the local rabbi, the famous Yaakov Ornstein. And there's actually a great story. There was a, a cherem. There was an excommunication made by Ornstein uh, against him. But, and I'll read it to you in a moment, the problem is at the time, it was illegal to excommunicate anybody in the Austrian Empire. Here's the cherem, how it goes. So we'll now read the cherem. Here's, here's the language. Dear brethren of the household of Israel, it's known that for a certain time now, culture and education, and also the study of the German language, have begun to spread among us. Those chiefly responsible are two well-known young people, Solomon Rappaport and Hirsch Nathkish. They publicly recite scripture in German translation, and with the commentary of the philosopher Moses Mendelssohn. They also agitate among all their friends and acquaintances, urging them to study languages and sciences. Therefore, with the authority of the Torah and of the holy rabbis, we decree against them and against their colleagues and against all who hold with them the great excommunication. And you can read here the kind of venom and hatred, and they're quite explicit about what it is that they hate. They're spreading German language. They're spreading these new interpretations of Mendelssohn and so on. Now, unfortunately for them, this was illegal, and the state came down, and they forced Rabbi Ornstein to publicly refute the excommunication. And actually, the story comes down that he was sitting, Rappaport was sitting in the audience and needling him on, saying, oh, I can't hear you, I can't hear you. And he forced him to recant. That didn't help much, actually, and ultimately Rappaport fled the city. What are you going to do? Uh, there were two Maskelic schools founded during this period in Tarnopol in 1813 and Brody in 1818. Their curriculum is as you would expect. They're teaching Bible, some Talmud, uh, Hebrew grammar, together with Polish, French, math, history, and geography. This is the curriculum of the Haskalah. And a similar schools established later in Lemberg in 1845. And these became influential centers for the Maskelim, but also sources of employment, something we'll see in Russia as well. They're also establishing modern synagogues in these cities. When I say modern, I want to recall from the last class, modern does not mean modern reform. It's really what we would probably call today something like modern orthodox. It means that there's a, a, di- there's a sort of a decorum in the place. It means there's a, a sermon in the German language with the rabbi, fa- f- given by the rabbi each week, an edifying sermon, not some kind of peel pool connecting verses of Talmud and so on. It means people pray together, all these sorts of things. Nothing that violates halakha, but rather a new style of Judaism. Uh, and I want to point out to you, if you look at the picture of Pearl, this is an absolutely uh, a religiously committed man. This man is absolutely religiously committed. In fact, his school had twice daily prayers obligatory, and he once fired a teacher who allegedly had violated Shabbat. Uh, and Krachmau and even Mises likewise called for the fulfillment of the commandments as absolutely obligatory. And this fits well, actually, with the conservative 
reactionary era of Metternich. They're not calling for religious reform. Krochler wrote the following, quote, Thank God, it's well known to all who come in the gates of my city that I have not cast off, God forbid, the yoke of the precepts and of the words of the teachers of blessed memory, and that I observe all the minutiae of the law and pursue regularly a course in the scriptures, the Mishnah, and the Gemara. This is a religiously conservative movement, very, very much so. And with Pearl's backing, Rappaport actually secures employment as the rabbi of Tarnopol in 1828. But after Pearl dies, we call that Pearl was a wealthy man and quite influential. After Pearl dies in 39, Rappaport is forced out as a heretical rabbi and leaves Galicia. Uh, a similar fate, actually much worse, happens to the masculine rabbi Abraham Cohn. He's hired at the modern temple in Lemberg. Recall that he was murdered in 48, almost certainly at the behest of Rabbi Orenstein when his food was poisoned. Uh, he was responsible, not Orenstein, Rabbi Cohen, he was responsible for the modern Jewish uh, school on Pearl's model, opening in Lombard in 1845. But he'd also championed the economic cause of, ab of abolishing the kosher meat and candle taxes. And this had a consequence too, because this threatened the Orthodox establishment economically, uh, which was profiting from that, from that tax. And he was actually even an early advocate of Jewish Polonization. We'll see next class and in the readings for next class that Jews were advocating Polonization in German language early on, which is quite an interesting phenomenon. In any event, uh, the heyday of Galician Haskalah, the heights of Galician Haskalah, are coming to an end in the 1850s and 60s. I want to remind you that the Maskilim truly venerated the absolute estate, but there's a problem because of the nature of the conflict with the Hasidim and Maskilim, um, they didn't quite appreciate what was going on. I mean, Rappaport wrote a dirge on the death of the Galician governor, Franz von Hoyer. Pearl is writing you know, poetry and, and literature of loyalty and love to the Austrian royalty. And note, by the way, the medals he wears, one from the emperor of Austria, one from the Tsar of Russia. That's what he was most proud of showing in his official portrait. But they made a critical miscalculation because in the revolutionary and reactionary period, uh, you know, partly because it was turning towards conservatism, partly because it doesn't want to foment unrest, the Austrian system uh, was really not interested in squelching the very popular Hasidic movement. Austrian control meant quiet. That means a secure relationship with the Polish aristocracy and a secure relationship with the Jews. Uh, but I also want to add one other point, and you read about this yesterday, uh, when it comes to Rachel Manikin's article on Hasidic movement, uh, the Austrian state accepted religious toleration, and therefore they were certainly not going to work with the Maskilim to try to destroy a Hasidic movement. And this is another place to remind ourselves of the changing historiography of East Europe in general, but also Galicia in particular. Uh, in this case, uh, we're, the, our readings for today contrasted, again, our good friend Mahler, uh, with the newer work of Nancy Sinkoff. And we see again Mahler. Uh, I have to read to you just a little bit so you get a sense of the kind of ideology that's affecting the scholarship. Here's how Mahler described Hasidism. Hasidism viewed the diaspora as the chief calamity of the Jewish people, the only remedy and ideal being messianic redemption and the return to Palestine. For the masculine, the problem of the diaspora in effect does not exist. And as a solution of the abnormal situation of the Jewish masses, they advocate education and linguistic assimilation. To the Hasidim, Galicia was a foreign land. Now, this is an interesting model. The Hasidim are almost proto-nationalists, right? And the Masculim are sort of proto-assimilationists. The problem with this is it's not grounded in reality. We've already seen how the Hasidim, you know, with the exception of some messianic groups, for the most part, they've neutralized that messianic element. They're finding personal redemption here. And in any event, their land of Israel, their Jerusalem, their temple is the Rebbe, is the Tzaddik in his court, here in, in the diaspora, right here in Galicia, in Bells, in Sanz, in Sadagor, in Chortka. That's where they're seeking redemption. That's where their pilgrimage is to. So this notion the Hasidim view this as some kind of foreign land I think it's quite problematic. And on the other hand, the Maskilim, it's true, advocated linguistic acculturation, but they also remain religiously conservative, uh, which means they're, they're praying for the Messiah, and they have no notion of messianic redemption other than the traditional one, because they're not going to any rebbe in Chortkov or Boyan. So to a certain extent, when we read these historical accounts, 
the, the, the scholarship is great and wonderful and important, but keep in mind the kind of ideologies that are affecting it um, as, as you go through it. And I think the contrast between Mahler and the, and the, the newer scholarship is, is quite pronounced and will be quite obvious to you. And finally, one last point. Note the overlapping battle of Maskilim and Mitnagdim early on. The Maskilim and Mitnagdim both hate Hasidim. Different reasons. The Maskilim uh, view it as anti-rational and so on, whereas the Mitnagdim see it as a heresy. But they both battle the Hasidim. That will remain the case uh, until the 1820s or 1830s. There will be a fluidity between the two groups in the earliest years of the East European Haskalah, which is reinforced by the fact that both coming from the same milieu, they're both coming from the East European yeshivot. The Maskilim are taking advantage of that erudition in Torah acquired in their pre maskilic days in order to prove the validity of the Haskalah from Torah sources. In any event, through Galicia, the Maskilim, the physical, the actual people themselves, and the Maskilic texts are going to spread throughout the Russian Empire as well, as, uh, and Galician merchants are going to settle in some of the new, in, in the Russian Empire, especially the frontier city of Odessa. And we'll come back to Odessa a little bit later. In the remaining time that we have, we want to take a brief overview, 20 minutes or so, of the major events on the Russian side of the border. So let's take a look at the Russian side. The first incident we want to look at is the uh, Maskil Isaac Bear Levinson, sometimes known as Ribal. Uh, this is during that time the fluidity between traditionalism and enlightenment was still happening but was about to be blocked. And it happens because of him in particular. Tsarist support for the Maskilim was tenuous, but it was present enough to give Russian Jews, especially the Hasidim, an image of Maskilic power. And when events seemed to give evidence to this, the impact on Jewish society was quite, quite profound. And this first happened in 1828. The great Hebrew writer Isaac Bear Levinson is awarded a grant of 1,000 rubles by the government, a phenomenal sum of money. Who is Levinson? Uh, he was born in Volhynia, eastern Ukraine, to a wealthy family, touch of enlightenment. His father spoke Polish, insisted that he study Bible and learn Russian. Later, like many masculine, he taught himself German and Latin and Greek. And he travels Galicia, where he associates with many of the most important masculine of the time. And he's very much influenced by their strong anti-Hasidism, and he begins to write his major work, Testimony in Israel, which argues for the permissibility of secular study and the necessity of productivizing Jewish economic activities. He says Jews need to learn Russian, farming, crafts, rabbis should have less power, and of course, hated, hated Yiddish language. These are all things that we've seen before. Uh, and this work was widely read by my scheme at the time, and when he got the stipend, he assumed that meant the Russian government shared his enlightened vision of Western Europe and wants to help him help the Jews. Uh, and the traditional Jews, on the other hand, saw that he was colluding with the with Tsarist government for the destruction of Judaism. So he's assuming the Tsarist government has this benevolent notion of helping the Jews achieve enlightenment, and the traditional Jews think the Maiskilim have colluded with the Tsar to destroy Judaism. And the truth is obviously somewhere in between, but I actually, believe it or not, probably closer to the traditional view. Uh, the Maskilim, again, have sort of a pathetic misjudgment about the goals of the Russian Empire. The Russian bureaucrats are completely ignorant of Jewish life. And so when the Maskilic uh, texts criticize the fanatical rabbis or that makes fun of their or attacks their misreading of the Talmud, this is understood by the Russian government as criticism of Judaism, as, as criticism of the Talmud as a whole. You know, they don't have a, a sense of the nuance that... Uh, you know, uh, between a masculine, conservative, you know, rational Judaism and what they viewed as an extremist version by, by the Hasidim. The Russian government doesn't have this commitment to enlightenment as such. The reward uh, was, the award was really a payoff for, for denouncing the Jews from their perspective. Uh, still, his being singled out by the government established the book as gospel for the enlightened, and its government support began to block that fluidity between traditionalism and Nakdim and enlightenment. Um, Levinson, for example, and many other previous Maskilim had received rabbinic endorsements, Haskamot, for their books, no longer. Traditionalists would no longer collaborate with Maskilim, uh, and the latter, the Maskilim, became more bold. They became emboldened in their statements. 
uh, Levinson's collaboration with the state opened the gates of Haskalah in Russia. Uh, and Maskilin started spreading ideas they learned while trading in Galicia or, or East Prussia, which is part of the German, German Empire, so to speak. Vilna probably emerges as the most important center of the Eastern Haskalah in, Ru in, Eastern Haskalah, Haskalah in Russia because of its status as a trade center between uh, Russian Empire and Western Europe. And there are stories actually of Maskilin. Uh, they, they, Maskilin would dress in the German style and would insist on speaking pure German and they became therefore known as Deutschen, as Germans. We saw that already in the last class, or the first class perhaps. Uh, but they had a problem because it was dangerous to appear that way in Vilna. And some of them actually maintained two wardrobes, which they would change. They went back and forth across the border. This was a very conservative uh, uh, Haskalah. I mean, what they mostly demanded what? A little secular education, a moderation of rabbinic stringency, uh, a subtle turn away from the Talmud is the sine qua non of Jewish intellectual erudition. They remained entirely observant Jews, many of them unwilling uh, or afraid to shave. Um, uh, they, they were trying to remain part of traditional society, just pushing it a little bit. This is very different, and I mentioned this a moment ago, than what's going on in Odessa. In Odessa, you have a cadre of Maskilim who moved there, and then this gets augmented in the 1820s by a large number of Galician Jews coming there for economic reasons, a bunch of wheat dealers from Brody, for example, uh, and it turns Odessa into uh, one of the most important centers of Haskalah in Russia, maybe the second most important after Vilna, but it's a different city because it's a frontier city, a completely new Jewish community, and it's, you know, there's no kihila, no kahal, no established rabbinic structure, um, and what's going to happen over the next century, actually, is that every masculine, everyone who wants to escape modern Jewish society, they know they go to Odessa. And, and many of the most famous and uh, literary and political figures of the late 19th century were spending time in Odessa. The expression in Yiddish went, hell burned seven miles around Odessa. And indeed, from many perspectives, it did. Uh, I guess we could say what happens in Odessa stays in Odessa, something like this. Uh, the number of Russian masculine was growing in the late 20s and 30s. You, you could even say growing quickly, but they were still a tiny minority of a massive population. Little coherence uh, as an intellectual social group, no power base, and, and so on. Their main goal was the establishment of some modern Jewish schools along the lines of Pearl School in Tarnopol. And its most significant, if meager results, were in the realm of educational reform. They did open four modernized schools, the most successful, as you would guess, in Odessa, doing what you'd expect them to do, Russian language and you know other standard Haskalah subjects. Uh, in 1838, Riga receives permission to bring a German Jewish Maskilic rabbi to head their German style school for the small Germanized community. And they decide to bring 23 year old graduate of the University of Munich, Max Lilienthal, who comes in 1840. And the school fails. But in 1841, Lilienthal is called by the Minister of National Enlightenment, Sergei Uvarov to head a proposed reform of the entire educational system of Jews throughout the empire. And this moment ends the first stage of the history of the Haskalah in Russia. And from now on, from the 1840s, it's going to be uh, the government, uh, along with the, with the Haskalah, consciously and seriously beginning a policy of spreading enlightenment to Russian Jews. Here's Max Lilienthal. So these are key years, the 1840s. Who was Uvarov? Uh, Uvarov, Uvarov, look, he's not bent on converting the Jews necessarily. I'm not that he's going to mourn that, but his goal is not to assimilate them per se. Uh, rather, he wants to regenerate them, right? This is the rhetoric coming from Western Europe. He wants to regenerate them. Uh, they are degenerate. They have these problems, and he wants to improve them. And he doesn't want to solve it by force, as some of the earlier policies of Nicholas I had done, but by re-education based on Maskelic principles. The government had already opened public schools to the Jews, but almost none of them, no, almost no Jews ever attended. And he wants to establish a network of Haskalah schools with state support to teach secular and religious subjects, as we'll see, he actually does establish about 71 of these by 1855. He's not able to get support among Russian Jews, so he decides Western Jews will spearhead the project, and he invites Lilienthal, keep in mind how young he was, uh, who contacts the most important figures in Western Europe, asks for teachers and so on to get the thing going. Um, there's severe opposition to Lilienthal. There's a whole story that I won't get into. And Uvarov decides 
to convene a rabbinic commission in 1843 to decide how to implement his desire for a new Jewish school network. There's a famous story, I won't go into the details, about uh, the leader of the Mitnagdim at the time was Rabbi Yitzchak ben Chaim of Volosian, the son of Rabbi Chaim of Volosian, uh, and Rabbi Menachem Mendel Schneerson, who is the third in the line of the Chabad Lubavitch Hasidic group. Uh, Schneerson absolutely refused to cooperate. Rabbi Yitzchak ben Chaim uh, tried to negotiate a better deal, thinking that uh, compromise would be, a, would be more effective. Uh, neither of them were especially effective, uh, but in any event, the battle lines are drawn. It's the government and the Moskvim on one side, and for lack of a better way of saying it, God and his people on the other. And this actually, by the way, is a moment we begin to see the kernel of an organized orthodoxy beginning to emerge. I'll come back to that in a minute. Uh, so this commission of 1843 serves as the second decisive turning point in relations between traditionalists and the Maskilim. The Haskalah is now on the side of, of the Russian government, and this is sealed with the passing of the law of 1844 on establishing special schools for the education of Jewish youth. And the goal was quite clear. The goal of the education of the Jews consists in their gradual reproachment with the Christian population and in the eradication of superstitions and harmful prejudices instilled by the study of the Talmud. And it called for establishing Jewish primary and secondary schools, uh, as well as rabbinical seminaries and the curriculum to be expected. Jewish law, for sure, but also Russian literacy and grammar, Hebrew literacy and grammar, that dual language, uh, hy hyphenated dual language we've seen over and over again, arithmetic, calligraphy. The secondary schools would then add uh, geography, history, mechanical drawing, and a variety of optional courses like bookkeeping and so on that would prepare you for a career. Uh, Jewish subjects would be taught only by Jewish teachers, Maskilim obviously, and the secular by either Jews or Christians, and the graduates would enjoy the same benefits as graduates of the Christian schools, which above all meant various levels of draft exemption. Uh, the first two rabbinical seminaries also established at the time to train loyal rabbis in 1847 in Vilna and in Zhitomir, and this further undermines a trend of Jewish communal authority uh, being cracked. There's other things going on in Russian history at the time, but this is undermining the authority of the Jewish community. The government requires rabbis to attend one of these two official seminaries, and what happens actually afterwards is you have sort of a dual rabbinate in the Russian Empire. On the one hand, you have the crown rabbis. They are officially permitted to be rabbis, paid from, official, from, from the Jewish taxes, um, and they have to have been graduated from one of these seminaries. Then you have the unofficial rabbis who most people actually prefer to go to for their various needs. The latter are paid from a now illegal fund based on the kosher meat tax. And soon thereafter, Lilienthal is out of the picture. He leaves Russia, ends up in America, uh, founder of American Reform Judaism, a whole other story. Uh, but the commission's recommendation goes through. And as I said, 71 schools are established by the end of Nicholas I's reign in 1855. Finally, we come to the third period of Haskalah, the Haskalah under Alexander II, 1850s, 1855 to 1881, when he's assassinated. This is really the heyday of the Haskalah in Russian Empire. Uh, not only in terms of numbers, it's still a tiny minority, but rather in terms of influence. There's a tremendous excitement of Maskilim with the accession and reforms of Alexander II. Uh, he was the one we call that emancipated the serfs in 1861, and he's issuing uh, edict after edict, law after law, which is lightening the burden on not only Jews, but also Jews. Uh, for example, opening the pale of settlement, the area that Jews were restricted to live in, to increasing numbers of Jews who could enter Mother Russia, several hundred thousand by the time he's assassinated. Uh, early Maskilim, moderate Maskilim, are transmitting their message in Hebrew, also even in Yiddish, highly optimistic, highly optimistic at this time. One of the most famous is Yehuda Leb Gordon, whose pictures on the screen. He's really among the Haskalah's most important spokesmen ever, this great representative of this moderate Haskalah, religiously observant, highly optimistic conservative. You can see the poem on your screen. So this poem is one of the most famous coming out of the Haskalah, east or west. Awake, my people, right? Awake, my people. How long will you sleep? Night is past. The sun shines through. Awake, cast your eyes hither and yon. Recognize your time and place. Recognize what's going on. 
It's finally happening. The dreams of the Haskala. It's finally happening. It's happening right here. Awake, my people, how long will you sleep? The night has passed, the sun shines through. And among the most famous lines, be a man, to, sorry, to the treasury of, your, of the state, bring your wealth, bear your share of its riches and bounty, be part of the state around you, be a man in the streets and a Jew at home, a brother to your countrymen and a servant to your king. In those lines, we see the whole project of the Haskalah, but also the optimism that it's really happening. Wake up to the surrounding culture, become citizens, dual identity, hyphenated Russian Jews, loyal, patriotic, integrated into the Russian Empire. And the Haskalah is also receiving considerable stimulus through economic changes. You have the growth of a class of Jewish merchants, even already under Nicholas I, uh, but now even more so. And they're learning Russian and language and math and other sciences. And actually, you have a whole class of thousands of Jewish families no longer dependent on Jewish society from an economic or social point of view. These Jews are wearing non-Jewish dress. They're beginning to neglect many religious precept, precepts. They're shaving their beard. They're drawing close to Russian language and culture. Um, the older Maskilim, the first Maskilim, self-taught, very familiar with Jewish literature. The new Maskil receives his education in a Russian Jewish school or maybe even in a general Russian school and was conspicuous for his you know, rather considerable alienation from Jewish tradition. And this contrast is quite important. The moderate Maskilim were interested in, in disseminating the Maskilic message through popular works, you know, in Yiddish, but especially Hebrew, uh, Jewish history, books that promoted optimistic patriotism, uh, European literature, science, romantic novels even. Uh, and there emerges at this point a normal Hebrew reading public, people educated in traditional houses of study, but interested in expanding their horizons. Yiddish literature would have expanded it even much more, but of course they weren't quite ready for that for the most part. That's the moderate Haskalah. But now you have a radical Haskalah coming out in the 1860s. They don't share the same optimism, and they don't share the same desire for a hyphenated Jewish-Russian dual identity as their conservative, moderate counterparts. They reassess the role of the Hebrew language. Was there any need to continue it? Why? Why do we need Hebrew at all? And this is the context, you know, there's a growing government policy of Russification, growing Russian cultural influence on Jewish intellectuals in the schools and universities. And they're calling not only for radical religious reform, even for outright assimilation. Uh, it's quite a break. And this is part of why it's right now in the 1860s we begin to see the emergence of orthodoxy in the East. And we'll see, see this much more in Galicia in a much more organized fashion. But even here in Russia now, you know, many Maskilim, especially the early ones, they were still fully observant, but the school-trained rabbis and other students from these schools are, are less than fully observant. Uh, and there's a shift, and there's a famous uh, event that happens when Moshe Leib Lilienblum, who later become a, a famous uh, early Zionist, uh, in 1868, he demands a rabbinical conference to reform the Shulchan Aruch, the Code of Jewish Law, and sets off a tidal wave that helps to solidify the Orthodox Camp. He eventually flees, by the way, from the, from the tumult and, of course, ends up in Odessa like everybody else. This is the time of a lot of ref major reform events happening in, in Germany, in Hungary, in America. A lot of public discussion about religious reform in Russia. And it begins to give the impression that the reform movement is succeeding and its increasingly radical nature is a grave threat to traditional Judaism. And Orthodox, for the first time, begin to push back using modern means. We'll see this, again, much more in Galicia. But even here in Paris, they launch, because of censorship rules, they launch in Paris a Hebrew journal, Halevanon, uh, which is, by the way, online now and accessible, as a forum to express themselves and oppose the Maskilim. This is a huge milestone. We'll speak about it another time. But the Orthodox, using the modern method of the press to fight for their cause, is an incredible transformative moment. Gordon, by the way, backs Lillian Bloom, but rejects the radical religious change he called for. He supported his right to call for the change and so on, but he himself was much more conservative, and he was very concerned about the loss of Hebrew among these radical masculine. You know, his, his, his other uh, most, his second most famous poem, perhaps even more so, For Whom Do I Toil? Well, he writes, For Whom Do I Toil? Why am I 
writing these Hebrew poems? Why am I talking about Zion and talking about Jewish culture? Maybe I'm going to be the last Hebrew writer and you the last Hebrew reader. We're being supplanted and there's a mournfulness to it that it's all being lost. The project isn't working. You know, he was a Hebrew poet and writer trying to advocate for Russian Jews to learn Russian fluently but to maintain the Hebrew, to maintain the Jewish heritage. And that's a difficult balancing act at this point. Finally, politically, Moschulim moved from the fringe of Jewish society and come to dominate Jewish politics by the 1880s, as you see on the screen. They do this through a few ways. First of all, they take over two key positions of traditional Jewish society, the informer and the shtatlan. Uh, you know, the Moschulim have been going to the, to the, trying to use the absolute state to their benefit, so the Hasidim, by the way, for many years. But now they're really becoming part of that state. For example, the role of censor is falling on the Moschulim, and also in many cases providing advisors to Russian ministers and bureaucrats of the Jewish society. That's now falling on the Moschulim. Um, and it's not only coercive, they're also becoming the Stadlin, the, the lobbyists. Now, they're not being hired by anybody to be the lobbyists like it used to be done. They're stepping up and volunteering. They have a knowledge of European languages and secular learning that puts them in a position to defend Jews. And they're acting openly, not discreetly. And they, they felt that the fragmentation of Jewish society, which was quite real, meant that somebody had to step into the brink. There was an acute need for national leadership, and they saw themselves as that choice. And secondly, the Moschulim developed institutions of power. First of all, the crown schools. We've already seen, not only is, is training hundreds and thousands of, of new masculine, but it's providing an economic base to the masculine as teachers and administrators. Second of all, the OPE, the Society for Promoting Enlightenment Among Jews in Russia, uh, funded by Baron Gunzberg uh, for various masculine projects, a very important source of power. And most importantly and most interestingly, the masculine press, the first one being Hamagid, a Hebrew paper in 1856 in Hebrew, in Russian, in Polish, and eventually, decades later, in Yiddish. Again, we'll speak about this another time, the fact that they refused, still refused to publish in Yiddish, despite the fact that vast majority of Jews could only read Yiddish, uh, is quite interesting. But in any event, in Hebrew, Russian, and Polish, and German, of course, um, they begin to publish uh, these new papers, and this builds masculine legitimacy it affects public opinion, but it also creates, it creates the sphere of public opinion. You know, they call, the reason why they call it Hamagid, Hamagid is the preacher. This is the new preacher. This is the new medium that's going to affect public opinion. And they begin to speak about the notion of the public will, that the public will was the legitimate basis of policy, the legitimate basis of what should be done. And we hear, see, obviously, here the origins of proto Jewish nationalism, among other things. And third of all, and really most importantly, most interestingly, is the Maskelik press, beginning with Hamagid in 1856 in Hebrew, in Polish, in Russian, not yet in Yiddish, uh, even though the vast majority of Jews could only read Yiddish. And when they finally begin to publish in Yiddish decades later, they're going to discover exactly the power of their reach. They still cannot overcome that mental block to publish in Yiddish. But in Hebrew, and then later in Russian, and in Polish, uh, in German, the Maschilic press is coming out, and it creates this new public sphere, you know, the new sphere in which Maschilim begin to think of themselves as being representatives of the Jewish people as a whole, and begin to think about the public will as a legitimate basis of policy. So, to bring this all together, you know, in 1881, there was a tremendous uh, explosion of pogroms and violence in Russia. Uh, very, very famous. And then the, the Tsar responds with these new decrees that really make the economic situation of the Jews in pale intolerable. People speak about this as the birth of Jewish politics. They speak about this moment as the moment where the Haskalah becomes totally uh, disillusioned, people lose faith in it, and so on. But besides the anti-Semitism, besides the pogroms, besides that, we need to see something happening internally. You know, criticism of the Haskalah is beginning already in the 1870s. Mass migration 
is actually beginning already in the 1870s, but there's something more. There's an internal momentum toward modern Jewish politics and identity, nationalism in particular. Take a look at the chart that I have in front of you. The Meirad Haskalah, we've seen this, optimistic, advocating modern, moderately religious, dual Russian Jewish identity, accepting the discourse of need for regeneration. And then we saw the radical Haskalah, beginning in the 1860s. It says a hyphenated identity is impossible. We don't want it. Therefore, but I like the modern. I like the modern. I like the secular. Um, I like that idea. So instead, I'm going to advocate for an unhyphenated Russian modern secular identity. But then you have people say, I agree with that. I, I, hyphenated identity is unattractive to me. But I don't want to be, I don't want to abandon the Hebrew. I don't want to abandon the Jewish. I don't want to abandon um, the idea that Jews need to change and modernize and regenerate. The hyphenated identity is impossible. So instead, we advocate an unhyphenated, modern, secular Jewish identity, whether it's Zionist or Yiddishist or another form of Jewish nationalist or Jewish socialist and so on. And the point of this is that modern Jewish politics is not simply a reaction to anti-Semitism and pogroms. It's not simply a reaction to disillusionment, but rather um, uh, it is coming from inside Jewish society. And this is especially important when we return to Galicia next time because there were no, with a few exceptions, there really were no pogroms in Galicia. There was some anti-Semitism, but there is no reversal of the move towards emancipation. On the contrary, next class we'll see Galician Jews are emancipated. And yet, even there, in fact, in some ways more so there, modern Jewish politics and modern Jewish identities emerge. And we have to remember there's a balance. There's the external impact of the surrounding society and the empire, and there's an internal momentum coming on. And the modern Jewish politics are not so much uh, reacting against the Haskalah as being born of the Haskalah. Uh, and that's where we'll end up next time. Next time we'll look, first of all, at the process of emancipation. And then after that, we'll look at the new politics coming out of it. And of course, most Jews are not Maskilim. Most Jews will not be members of these, new, of these new political organizations in the 1880s and 1890s. But the ideologies of the Haskalah and the modern Jewish movements that come out of it, these will set the parameters of modern Jewish identity and politics in the 20th century for all Jews. So we need to look at these thousands of elites who are creating first the Haskalah and then the modern Jewish movements that come out of the Haskalah because that will set the parameters for the 20th and 21st centuries. Thanks so much. I'll see you next time. Take care.